come up to Philippians chapter 2, and uh, we'll be looking today at that particular text. I'd like to begin today with a, a little self-revelation, and John has already stolen a little bit of my thunder, but I thought I'd talk about my ethnicity at first. Uh, um, certainly, you can probably guess by the name Nelson that I'm, uh, uh, that I'm part Swedish, and that's where my name comes from. But I am seven other nationalities, including part Native American. Something else you may not know about me is I'm also very light sensitive when it comes to sleeping at night. In fact, I need total darkness to get a good full night's rest. These longer days of summer are hard for me to get full night's rest when the light comes pouring in. So in our bedroom at home, my wife and I have blinds on our window. Then we have these thick, heavy curtains that overlap, theater-type curtains in our bedroom. So it's literally pitch dark. And my dear wife, uh, she calls it uh, co or compares it to sleeping in a cave. And that's what it's like. And see, those are things about me you wouldn't know if I didn't reveal them to you. Now, do you realize that the Bible is God's self-revelation to us? You know, we always use the word special revelation, but it is God's self-revelation to us where He reveals who He is. He reveals what He does in this world, and He reveals what His desires are for us. Now, the Bible doesn't contain everything that could be said about God. In fact, John, the gospel writer, tells us that there's so much more that could be said about Him. In fact, all the libraries of the world could not contain what could be said about our God. But what we do have is what God wants us to know, or what we fondly say in the covenant, what we, we, we have everything we need for faith, doctrine, and conduct. Well, when it comes to talking about starting and strengthening churches, there is no better place to look in the Bible than the book of Philippians. You see, this is a book that was written to a young, early church that was struggling uh, with conflict. Our internal strife existed there. And the Apostle Paul, writing to this church, uh, encouraged them to, be, to live in harmony with one another. Look at Revel or, excuse me, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27, if you have your Bibles open with me. Whatever happens... Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or hear only about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as that of Christ Jesus. And then to chapter four, 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 verse two, I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to be w w of the same mind in the Lord. See, the apostle is urging the church at Philippi to work at bringing healing to their community of faith, to get their own house in order, and to keep at it until the church is completely healthy. Next week, I will be starting my 27th year at Mission Covenant Church in Poplar, Wisconsin. And when I uh, came to the church, I had some prior knowledge of the church. And also in the candidating and call process, I uh, picked it up right away that there were some situations of conflict that existed in the church. Actually, there were seven of them. See, there had been a few extramarital affairs that had happened among people in the church. And there had been some adultery that took place. And there had been some sexual immorality and some other things. Seven of these cases existed and they happened just before I got there. And if you think of a small congregation, a hundred or less in a small town to be facing those kinds of situations when many people are related to one another, let me just suffice by saying it was a mess. So I recognized right away that first and foremost, besides fervently praying through these struggles, that the first thing we needed to do was study together the book of Philippians so we could have the mind of Christ. Now, the passage before us this morning, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 16, teaches us that the church is called to work at its spiritual well-being until its health is fully established. And you know, when we do this, we embark on a journey. And in that journey, we end up discovering that we are merely cooperating with God. Look at verse 12 here with me in our text. 
Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I know you recognize that linking word there, therefore, but that ties us to the earlier chapter of uh, here in chapter 2, that great glorious hymn that, that was sung in the early church about the self-emptying Jesus Christ, the one who gave himself and has humbled himself to be our Savior, who is also our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the message in light of Christ's example of obedience is continue in your good record of obedience, Philippians, as you did before in my presence and now much more in my absence. See, the Philippian church needed this reminder from the Apostle Paul that they were growing spiritually ill, that they had gotten off mission, and the cure for this was, to, this was the necessary steps to restore spiritual health by working at restoration in the church with respect and reverence for others. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I must say that I believe many people mishandle this text by overlooking what the author's intention was here within the historical context. You see, they rip it right out of this context and they start having all kinds of discussions about what this can mean or can't mean here in the text. And this verse is not referring here to individual salvation. It is referring to corporate salvation as both the possessive pronoun and the verb both show us here in this passage. They are both plural. And in addition, let me mention to you that the Apostle Paul says basically the same thing in Acts chapter 27, verse 34, and that's recorded for us there by his traveling companion and friend, Dr. Luke, and this uses the same word here, soterion for salvation, that's recorded for us in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. And of course, the back story here is that the Apostle has just been shipwrecked off the island of Malta, and these, sold, these uh, sailors did everything they could to help help him and survive. And, and in fact, they had been in so much suspense and turmoil for literally two weeks that the, uh, the apostle here told them that they needed to eat. And here's what he said, verse 34, now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. There it is. That's that word. And what Paul is saying is you need this food for your own well-being, to be saved in that sense, for your own deliverance, your own salvation. Yes, the word salvation in most cases in the Bible refers to the saving of one's soul, but not in every instance. It can also mean deliverance or well-being or, or in that sense, one's health. So Philippians, work out your problems until your health is fully established, until every trace of spiritual disease, selfishness, uh, dissension, and disunity is gone. And do this with fear and trembling. Yes, there needs to be an attitude of respect and reverence toward one another in the church of Jesus Christ, when addressing differences, when dealing with conflicts, and even when facing change. And God says we can resolve our conflicts, but we have to obediently work them out by respecting each other. And we do that by following the example of Jesus Christ who humbled himself before us and before the world. We have to be able to do that through Christ, admitting our faults, uh, talking them out, and then seeking forgiveness. As I mentioned earlier in the message, we prayerfully and graciously went to work on these moral dilemmas that Mission Covenant Church was facing. And it wasn't easy, and it's a long story, but to shorten the story, let me tell you, when we got down the road, four or five years down the road, and the reconciliation took place, it was incredible. To see a church be reconciled with one another, to see families be reconciled to each other, it was absolutely powerful. Two of our former members who had been the perpetrators of this came to consecutive membership meetings and confessed their sin before the church members, asking them for forgiveness. On one Sunday morning, one of these members, another member, as well as another worship leader who had been uh, in deep violation of God's Word as well, stood before our congregation and asked forgiveness for their sins against God and their sins that they had committed against God and against the congregation. Friends, it was powerful. The weeping, the hugging, the expressions of love, the forgiveness and the healing is something that I will cherish the rest of my life. Following that, our church got healthy and back on mission. And that is when things really began to take off. 
Now, maybe you're sitting here today thinking, wow, that sounds wonderful, Pastor Nelson, but I I don't know if I could do that. I I don't know if I can admit my faults uh, or humble myself before others like that or own my own junk, or I don't know if we can address conflict like that in our church. Well, uh, don't fear. Verse 13 tells us how. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. See, it is God who works in you. It is God who works in our churches. And it is God who is out there achieving his good will in this world. See, this word for work here is where we get the English word for energy. God is the great energizer. And this is how God works. Uh, The work of healing happens. In the church, God leads. We follow by taking action, following his word. And God upholds us this entire time. Now, I do want you to know today that God did give us glimpses of what he was up to in the midst of resolving our moral conflicts. One of our faithful members, Helen Savage, passed away unexpectedly back on Thanksgiving night, 1991. She was a delightful lady, a member uh, of our church, faithful member. She used to take the church van every single Sunday morning, pick up a van full of kids, bring them, drop them off for Sunday school, circle back, and pick up another van full of kids. And see, life wasn't easy for her. She lost her husband when she had four small children. He died on the operating table. She raised her children predominantly as a single parent, only later in life to be able to marry a wonderful, remarry to a wonderful Christian man. But she wanted every kid reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. She also owned a little convenience store on one of the main roads in our area, out in the woods, but, but it was on one of the main roads uh, to support herself and her family. And people would stop by constantly, people in need, and she had a hard time turning them away. In fact, to a fault, she would extend credit uh, to some of the folks that, that were in deep need out there. And even the hobos back in the 60s and 70s that rode the trains behind her place nailed a sign to the tree about 100 yards back in the woods with an arrow pointing to her store, food. Well, she died unexpectedly of a massive heart attack at 57 years of age on Thanksgiving night, 1991. And we knew it was going to be a big funeral, but we had no idea what was going to happen. Our little church would seat about 100 people, and we had it all ready. We had televisions in the basement. We had cameras set up. We were going to fill the choir loft. We were going to set chairs up. But 400 people showed up that day, and they filled every spot we had. And when the funeral director came in to close the coffin for the, the, you know, make the final preparations, he turned to leave He couldn't go anywhere because people surged in behind him and they were standing. Everybody, every square inch of the church was filled. And my simple prayer at that moment was, oh Lord, please don't let this building collapse. (laughs) And and I thought, oh, if there's a fire marshal in here, we're going to get a major fine out of this one. And uh, it was a powerful service. Three other pastors were involved. The former pastor had come back. Uh, uh, they shared eulogies and prayers and, and uh, read scripture. And I, and I preached a powerful message by God's grace that day. And it was eyeball to eyeball. And when we got done with the service, when we went outside, some of our members who weren't able to get into the building mentioned to us that there were about 50 people that were turned away that day because there was no place for them. And they walked away uttering under their breath, They have no room for us. They have no place for us. And that became a metaphor for us in a spiritually unhealthy and and a church that was off mission. That became a metaphor for us that we had to get our house in order because we didn't have space for those who God cared about and the things God cared about. Well, when we got healthy and we worked through the process of healing and things started to take off, that's when we realized that we were simply cooperating with God. We had joined God in what God was up to. And it was then that we began to realize that the main reason for spiritual health in the church is so that our purpose as a witnessing community would be fulfilled. Look at verse 14. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. See, the Philippian community, like many churches, had been broken by dissension. And they were to overcome their social discord, and they were to save the relationships in the church, and frankly, get back on mission, get healthy, by adapting humble and respectful attitudes toward one another. And to do it all, not some of it, but all of it, without grumbling or complaining. You know, when it comes to starting and strengthening churches, working against disunity, is a crucial element in our witness to before a watching world. 
Do you realize the importance of what I just said to you? See, church unity is one of the most powerful tools of evangelism that a church can have in its arsenal. Jesus said as much in John 13, 34 through 35. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples because you have love one for another. He said in the high priestly prayer in John 17, 20 and 21, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. As you are in me and I am in you, they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. You know, the unbelieving world out there doesn't know a lot about the Bible. And they don't understand a lot about Christianity or about the church. But there's one thing they seem to innately understand. That if all this stuff is true, these people ought to be able to get along with one another. They should be able to work together. And that, my friends, is the power of unity in the church. This passage goes on to teach us that improvement is possible that we can grow in our relationships, that we can become better Christians. Verse 15, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. You see, by God's grace, it is possible to become better and better, to sin less and less, to not be a church that is easy for an unbelieving world to find fault in. And then it tells us we will shine like stars in the sky or we will be the light of the world that God has called us to be. You know what is true? These are very challenging times for the church. The world is getting more and more perverse all the time. If time allowed, I could share with you some horrific accounts of abuse, exploitation, immorality, even violence that we have experienced in our years in the ministry of the gospel at Mission Covenant. And there isn't much about human behavior that surprises me anymore. And the top of the list is the proliferation of drugs right now in our culture. Our largest high school in our county has gone to random drug testing for all those who participate in co-curricular activities. If you're going to be in sports, if you're going to be in drama, anything that's after school, then you have to agree to sign a waiver to have random drug testing. And not just a urine test, but they can pluck a hair out and they can evaluate that because it shows that the drugs have been in your system much longer. Now, set aside whatever your, your preferences here are politically about you know, someone's invasion of their privacy or violation of private, private rights, and just ask yourself, why would a school resort to drug trusting? It's because of the pro- proliferation of drugs. We have a major pipeline con- uh, company in our county that hires a lot of people, but they send them all over the country and all over the world. Many of them right now are being sent to North Dakota, Wyoming, out to Pennsylvania, places like that. But when they have openings, they get an influx, hundreds and hundreds, you know, multiple applicants, because these are big jobs. I mean, some of them get up to six-figure incomes, and so people want to work there. And recently, they had a big hiring, and they narrowed it down to their 200 best candidates, and they drug tested them. 150 of the 200 failed the drug test. We have a family in our church that owns a salvage company that uh, uh, takes down uh, old ore docks on Lake Superior. And uh, they take the, the salvage materials and sell them, and that's how they make their money. But there's large poles that go up 140 feet in the air. And this family lives on a houseboat right on site so that nobody plunders what they've been so carefully taking down so they can sell. Well, all of the copper on those poles has disappeared at night, windy and cold. This isn't old duffers that are doing this because someone like me could climb 15, 20 feet and then I'd probably pass out and it would be over. But these are young people that are stealing this copper and without question, it's related to the proliferation of drugs. In our county, our claim to fame for our county is we have the second most bartenders per capita of any place in the United States. We get beat out only by Las Vegas, Nevada, which is a destination point. Our people simply drink. Now, these are challenging times. 
We have a very poor economy. Our young people graduate from high school 15 to 20 a year in our church, and they leave our church. We commonly have 40 to 50 people move away from our church every single year. We also have 10 to 12 of our faithful that pass on and go be with Jesus. And so you can see that we have to grow dramatically just to maintain. With all of these challenges that we face, I must tell you, it's exactly what Leith Anderson shared with us last night. I have never seen a more exciting time to be in ministry than right now. Since January 1 of this year, we've had 67 people accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord in our little village of less than 500 people. In the month of April, I had the opportunity to proclaim the gospel in a 19-day stretch to over 3,000 people, 1,600 of them, 1,600 of them uh, were different people. And in the last 26 months in our church, we've had 167 people come to faith in Jesus Christ. It's all that we can do. It's all that we can do to follow them up. Now, let me share with you, if you've picked up anything today, you've probably figured out, this guy's pretty passionate about this stuff, starting and strengthening churches. And it's true, but I want to tell you why. See, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I was brought up in a very impoverished home, a poor home. I lived in northern Minnesota with my family in a three-room tar paper shack with no plumbing. And uh, it got worse from there because a few months before my sixth birthday, my father passed away. A virus attacked his heart. They couldn't do anything for him. That was before heart transplants. They shipped him to Rochester. There wasn't a thing they could do. He left behind a wife, with four, a 26-year-old wife with a 10th grade education, didn't have a driver's license, living out in the wilderness close to Canada, and, uh, and four small children, seven years of age and under. Well, it got worse from there. Three years later, my mom remarried. Turns out the man was a bigamist married to another woman at the same time. He also was an alcoholic. And my mom subsequently developed a drinking problem. And what would happen is after, well, a year into that relationship, she found out he was married to another woman. So the marriage was annulled. They broke up, separated for a while. But then they just decided to get back together and just live together. And what would happen is they would get in some of their drunken arguments and fights and the, whoever had the lease on the place kicked the other one out. So we moved seven times my last eight years of school. But the only saving grace there was the last four moves, we were in the same school system. And it was there that a rural covenant church began to reach out to me. They picked me up for Sunday school and brought me uh, to church. I played football with one of the sons of this family, and so they reached out to me, eventually reached out to my entire family. All four of my uh, sib or three siblings also ended up going to church uh, there, tried to reach out to our parents, but that didn't work out in that situation. But they reached out to us children. I have to tell you, I was a handful. And, it's a, and I'm ashamed to admit this before you today, but I acted out in church, which is not surprising under the circumstances. But I would take big pens apart and I would make spit wads out of the bulletin, and I would shoot across to see who I could hit in the worship service. So the church's solution to that was to assign two big truck drivers to sit wherever I was at. <laughs> Giant hands from shifting gears. It's where I got my first anatomy lessons. I never knew what a trapezius muscle was <laughs> until that hand would come over and squeeze or that's when I realized that the cranial cavity sounded pretty empty up there, where there would be click, click, click. But three and a half years later, I came to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord after hearing the gospel over and over in that church. But it didn't end there, see, because my senior year of high school, uh, my former stepdad and my mom decided to get remarried. He got divorced from the other gal, and it was a mess because she just caught him with another woman, but they still got together and uh, decided to get married, and none of us children would go. Does anyone here see why these two shall not be married? Do now confess it, or else here ever forever hold your peace. See, it was a hard thing to do, but my mom asked out of love for her if we would go, and we went. Two weeks later, I came home from work, actually school, and I had to go to work. And um, I, from the time I was 13 years of age, I bought every stitch of clothes I ever wore. So I was always working on the side besides going to school. And I came home, I needed to get to my shift at work, and my stepdad needed help on something. I couldn't help him. He was already pretty inebriated at that point. Came back four hours later, nobody was there, and uh, he picked an argument with me, kicked me out of the house. Now, you should know that he, at 16 and a half years of age, got kicked out of his house by a drunken stepfather as he was, a, was assaulting his, 
handicapped, disabled sister, and he stepped in to try to protect his sister, he got kicked out of the house. So the cycle repeated itself. Well, here I was, $50 to my name, 18 years old, homeless. What do I do? I called a teacher from the high school and I stayed with him for a while, but that wasn't a long-term solution. And he wasn't a Christian. He was a good man, but wasn't a Christian. I needed something more. And I thought of a young man in our church, our covenant church, who was active in the youth group and he was active in a ministry called Youth for Christ, mid-20s. And he lived in an apartment with, uh, with three other guys, all young guys starting out in their careers. What I didn't know was all of them were from covenant churches. They met in college at university and then, and then ended up uh, rooming together as they started out their lives together. They lived in a community 20 miles away, and I called him up, asked if there's any chance I could stay with him for a while. He said, let me check with my roommates, but I'm sure it'll work out. And they said yes. There I was, like the parable of the Good Samaritan, laying by the side of the road. And they came along and said, we got to do something. We got to help this guy out. And the gentleman, his name was Greg, who took me in, uh, he gave up his bed. He took a mattress and he threw it on the floor in the living room. For one year, he lived like that. And they prayed with me every single day. They taught me the Bible every single day. They prayed with me. When I would be grieving or weeping, they would weep with me. If I needed something, they helped me out. If I needed to use a car, they let me use their car. Everything. It literally changed the entire trajectory of my life. And I I want you to understand here today, please understand, when we're talking about starting churches and we're talking about strengthening churches, It's very personal to me, okay? It's very visceral. That's where the passion comes from. And I, you know, I stutter to think of where my life would be today if I had maintained in the generations of alcoholics that exist in my family and the dysfunction and the poverty and the pain and the suffering, all of that compared to what I'm experiencing in Christ Jesus today. The lovely wife I get to be married to, you know, the wonderful children I am blessed to have. The, the church that I can minister in and, and, uh, and encourage. It's, it's remarkable. And, and I, 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 I stutter to think of where my life would be today. And you know, now we have a son who's a covenant minister. A new cycle has started. All because people gathered together and agreed to do the work of the Lord. Let's pray. God, our Father, we thank you so much this morning for your word. Your word is so powerful, and it speaks to us so clearly, God, about who you are, God, what you do in this world, and God, what your desires are for us. God, I don't know what everybody's experiencing that's come to this meeting today, but God, I know the beauty and the power of spiritual health, and I thank you so much for your grace that has been poured out in my life in my family, in the church that I now am privileged to pastor, and God, upon this this denomination. Oh, I pray, God, as we're talking about starting and strengthening churches, that our tribe may increase. To your honor and glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.